good evening, everyone. My name is Marah Khalifa. I am the research and program officer at the Palestinian Museum. And we're joined here um, together for the launch of Open Gaza Architectures of Hope. Um, inspired by the innovation and experiences of the people of Gaza, this book engages environmentalists, urban planners, activists, and scholars to uh, offer hopeful architectural solutions to envision a better place for Gazans and Palestinians. Open Gaza engages the Gaza Strip within and beyond the rationalities of siege and warfare. It considers how life can be improved despite restrictions imposed by the Israeli blockade and away from the absurd absurdity of violence and warfare. Uh, we'll start with an introduction uh, by Adil al aidi uh, Haniya, General Director of the Palestinian Museum, who will talk uh, to us about uh, the Palestinian uh, Museum's new exhibition titled A People by the Sea, Narratives of the Palestinian Coast. Then we'll move to an introduction by uh, Dean Sharif Sharp, who is the co co-director of Terraform and an LSE fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science in Geography and Environment. Uh, after that, we'll uh, be given a presentation by uh, Sarah Roy, who is a senior research scholar at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, specializing in the Palestinian economy, Palestinian Islamism, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, then we'll uh, hear from uh, Yara Sharif and Nasser Golzarai, who are practicing architects and academics with an interest in design as a mean to facilitate and create, um, create resilient communities within contested ge geographies. Um, at the end, we will, hear, we will uh, be given a presentation, um, an intervention command uh, by Helen Naji, who is an architect and an artist and a PhD stu uh, student at University of West Minister. Um, I want to mention that the book will be available at the Palestinian Museum gift shop uh, very soon. Uh, and also the session is being recorded. It will be published on our social media platforms and our YouTube channel uh, in a couple of days. And now I'll leave you with uh, Dr. Adila. Shukran, shukran, Marah. Uh, okay, hal sauti masmoua amnih fi tarjame, Marah, lahad ilmik. في ترجمة راح يكون يعني أكمل هلا أحكي جمانة تكمل بتقدر تكملي عادلة تمام أوكي شكرا مراح thank you مراح and welcome all this is the brochure for بلد وحده البحر محطات من تاريخ الساحل الفلسطيني راح أحاول أعطي لمحة سريعة عن المعرض وتقاطعاته مع غزة ولماذا المعرض ليس عن غزة المعرض فتح الأسبوع الماضي ورح يستمر له تقريبا سنة يواصل المتحف من خلال هذا المعرض الجديد تحقيق رسالته في إنتاج ونشر تجارب معرفية تحررية عن فلسطين شعبا وثقافة وتاريخا مع هذا المعرض ومع المطبوعات والفعاليات العامة والتربوية والفكرية المرافقة له والتي سيقدمها لكم على مدار هذا العام والفعالية اللي إحنا فيها اليوم جزء من هذه الفعاليات مع هذه الفعاليات يسير المتحف في نهجه الجديد لإنتاج المعرفة حول فلسطين ما هو الجديد في هذا النهج؟ هذا النهج الجديد هو متمثل في تقديم توليفة تجمع بين معرفة تاريخية محكمة مادة وثائقية غنية وتدخلات فنية وتصميمية متعددة الوسائط مع خلق مساحات لملامسة تجارب الماضي حسيا ومعرفيا داخل قاعة المعرض وخارجه من خلال هذه الفعاليات انبثقت فكرة إقامة هذا المعرض حول تاريخ الساحل الفلسطيني قبل ثلاث سنوات ونسعد اليوم بمشاركتكم ورؤيتنا حول تجارب وإنجازات شعب هذا الساحل عبر قرون عدة رغم محاولات محو فلسطينيته المعرض هذا يتناول يعني يبدأ نقطة الانطلاقة هي 1748 مع تأسيس لظاهر عمر عاصمته في لكيانه السياسي والاقتصادي في عكا وطبعا ينتهي ب 1900 يعني مع النكبة أو ما بعد النكبة ما بدي أدخل هلأ بتفاصيل المعرض ولكن بدي أحكي شوي وباختصار عن التقاطعات مع غزة الفكرة الأساسية لماذا غزة ليست جزء من هذا المعرض لأنه كانت نقطة الانطلاق طبعا هي المحو والتطهير العرقي 
والاباده التي تعرض عليها تعرض لها سكان الساحل الفلسطيني شمال خلينا نقول الساحل في ال 48، بينما تجربه غزه بال 48 كانت مختلفه ويكاد ينسى حتى الجمهور الفلسطيني يعني ناهيك عن عن الناس خارج فلسطين انه هذا الساحل كانت له يعني حضور وحيويه وتجربه سياسيه وثقافيه واقتصاديه متنوعه قبل ال 48 وحتى بثلاثه قرون فنحن نسرد هذه التجربه كنحو كنحو من نشر المعرفة حول هذا الجزء المنسي من التاريخ الفلسطيني وبحب أنوه أنه كان في إحنا المعرض هو من عمل القيمة الفنانة إناس ياسين واستند على مشهورة تاريخية من الدكتور عادل مناع والدكتور محمود يزبك لكن طبعا غزة حاضرة في هذا المعرض أولا في عنا مادة وثائقية غنية حول حكومة عموم فلسطين اللي احنا بنقدمها في المعرض حكومة عموم فلسطين اللي كان طبعا مقرها غزة وطبعا كان عندها مشاكل عدة لكن احنا بنقدمها في المعرض عبر مادة وثائقية وبصرية كجزء من محاولات الاستمر... الإيجاد استمرارية سياسية ل... 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 نوع من الكيان الفلسطيني المستقل بعد ال 48 وكان في غزة كذلك عندنا فيلم وثائقي ومادة بصرية وثائقية تعرض داخل المعرض حول تجارب اللجوء وتأسيس المخيمات اللجوء في غزة مادة بصرية نادرة لم تعرض من قبل وأخيرا طبعا لدينا غرفة هامة جدا عمل فني للفنان والمصور الغزاوي شريف سرحان نحن سعداء باستضافتها بحب أنوه كمان إنه المعرض الفل... المتحف الفل... point out that the Palestinian Museum has a five year program plan which includes having an exhibition for so... وتجارب وكل التجارب التاريخية والسياسية فيه ونحن نأمل أن ندشن هذا المعرض قبل بعد سنتين عفوا فهذا فقط اللي حبيت أقدمه كإطار للفعاليات اللي عم بقدمها المعرض حاليا المتحف حاليا واللي عم بيحتضن من خلالها هذا النشاط اللي إحنا فخورين بتقديمه لجمهورنا فشكرا لإصغاءكم شكرا Great. Well, thank you for that introduction and, and uh, thank you to the Palestinian Museum for inviting us to launch the book Open Gaza, Architectures of Hope that I co-edited with Michael Sorkin, who sadly passed away in March 2020 from COVID. And to start this presentation, I'm just going to make a few remarks about, about who Michael was and his importance to uh, the... Uh, sorry, let me just get this up. And his importance and to talk about some of the, the, the work that he did through Terraform and also um, the contents of the book Open Gaza. I'm really honored as well and, and just want to express my gratitude for Sara Roy for also making some remarks uh, and for also supporting this book and to Yara Sharif and Nasser Ghazari for also contributing and they also you know display some of the content of the, the book in terms of their contribution and also to Hala who will be uh, Hala Naji who will be also offering some remarks around the book and and how you know it's being utilized and and thought of, and, and this is a very active process, an active book that um, I hope is resonating with people within Gaza, within Palestine, um, but also of course, within those, those outside and those interested in that this is a way in to those that may not know much about what is happening, but also to show a different side of the uh, Palestinian cause uh, and the people within historic Palestine that I will go into more detail in a moment. But first, I want to tell you about our beloved comrade, Michael Sorkin. Architect, teacher, writer, mentor, 
Michael was and continues to be the conscience of urbanists and architects everywhere. It was Michael that led the call for architects to resist engaging in the designs of prisons, or as he called them, death chambers. When Trump was elected, Michael was at the forefront of denouncing that embarrassing, I quote, statement by the director of the American Institute of Architects that committed architects to working with president-elect Trump. Michael was clear on where he thought the profession should stand on the election of Trump and denounced those in his profession that sought to work with his administration. Equally, when it came to Palestine, Israel, Michael understood the entanglement engagement of so many architects and engineers in the oppression and dispossession of Palestine. <laughs> مدن عادلة وجميلة لكوكبنا وقد شدد عليها من خلال مشاريع كثيرة أنشأها من خلال منظمة غير حكومية تسمى تيروفورم وهي مركز لتعزيز البحث المعماري وتأسست عام 1995 وأنتجت دراسات كبيرة حول كثير من الأمور مثل الطوارئ المتعلقة بتغير المناخ والعمارة في المدن وأبحاثها تبادر إليها ذاتيا ولا تتلقى أي تمويل من مؤسسات دولية أو شركات أو حكومات هذه الدراسات موجهة للبحث والتصميم المتاح للمجتمعات المختلفة ولأولئك المهتمين بالتخطيط العمراني وهذه معرفة ينتجها خبراء ويضعونها تحت خدمة الشعوب وبيئتهم وعليه فإن تيريفورم تتراوح في اهتمامها ما بين الأيض والكفاءة الذاتية وكفاءة الغذاء وغيرها من الأمور التي ترتبط بالمدن وتدرس ما ينبغي على المدينة أن تفعله لتطعم نفسها وكيف سيكون شكلها ومايكل قاد تحقيقا حول التوسع في جامعة كولومبيا في هارم وكيف أثر هذا على المجتمعات المحيطة وسأل ما الذي يكلف جامعة كولومبيا بعدم إبعاد هذه المجتمعات التي كانت تعيش في حرم الجامعة قبل أن توسع مبناها بأن تدمجها في حياة الجامعة عوضا عن ترحيلها وقد أنتج هذا الكتاب أوفين غازا ويركز على فكرة إذا كنا نحن كبشر نتشارك في هذا الكوكب وإذا كان بإمكاننا تحقيق هذه المدن العادلة والمستدامة والجميلة ولكن مشروع أوفين غازا نشأ من خلال غضب مايكل من الحرب التي شنتها إسرائيل عام 2014 على غزة والتدمير الكبير الذي لحق بالقطاع وكانت هذه تال العملية الثالثة ضد قطاع غزة وتحدثنا على الهاتف معا وكان يفكر بالتدخلات الإنتاجية من خلال المهتمين بالتصميم والنشطاء في مجال التنظيم العماري وبدأ مع ناصر غزاري ويرى الشريف بجامعة في لندن وقام بزيارة غزة عام 2010 للمساعدة في عملية الإعمار بعد عملية الرصاص المتصبب ومن ثم قاد المحادثات بين الفريق ما أدى إلى هذا الكتاب من هذا المجموع نظمنا أنا ومايكل عدة لقاءات في أنحاء العالم وكانت هناك عدة مؤسسات بحثية استضفتها تيريفورم ومؤسسات أخرى لنبحث في معمار غزة وتاريخها والفكرة لم تكن فقط لإدانة خراب غزة والحصار المفروض عليها ولكن لتخيل والحفاوة بصمود المكان وطرح الأمل فإن أوفين كازا يتعامل مع مفهوم بأنه إن هذه منطقة عمرانية بشكل كبير وهي غنية بسكانها وبالنسبة لمايكل فإن هذا كتابه الثالث الذي يركز على قضية فلسطين وإسرائيل كتابه الأول القدس التالية يتحدث عن هذه المدينة بعد ثلاث سنوات من البدء في بناء جدار الفصل 
هو يتحدث عن تفاؤل الذي أتت به اتفاق أوسلو ومن ثم ما تبع ذلك من تدمير للأمل ويتبع هذا النمط في كتاب أوبن غزة حيث يتحدث مع علماء اجتماع ومعماريين وخبراء عمرانيين من فلسطين وإسرائيل ومناطق أخرى بالعالم من خلال طرح تحليل وتقديم رؤى تقدمية لمستقبل يتم تخيله بين الفلسطينيين والإسرائيليين إن هذه المساهمة تطرح فكرة مدينة زاخرة تربط غزة بين المدن القريبة منها مثل بئر السبع والقدس والخليل وهذا يتخيل كيف ستكون شكل غزة في ظروفها الطبيعية إذا كان بإمكانها أن تستضيف كافة السكان في كل مناطقها المحيطة وأن تعيش حياة طبيعية الخطة هي عن الانضمام وليس التقسيم وإذا كانت هناك مواصلات في المدينة وإذا كان هناك سياق عمراني يمكن فيه تخيل هذا التصميم إن أوبن غازا لا يتحدث فقط عن أفكار من أجل مستقبل أفضل بل إنه أيضا يتحدث عن الإنجازات التي تحققت مثل مركز القطان للطفل وهذا المكان الأنيق والذي تم بعمارة فلسطينية ويمكن الأطفال أن يدخلوا إليه ويستمتعوا بنشاط مختلفة سالم القدوة وتصميمه في بيت لاهية للمساكن لمتوسطي الداخل يبين كيف تكون مناسبة بيئيا أيضا في سياق مثل هذا يشتمل هذا الكتاب على رؤية داخلية ل. In their understanding and engagement with the Palestinian question, and political scientists like Tarek Bakoni, who highlight the global solidarity that exists for Palestinian Gazans and Palestinians more broadly, despite efforts to continue to cut communication from the outside world. Several contributors also undertake a critical examination of the Gaza reconstruction mechanism. Michael and I, in editing this collection, sought not only to highlight the immiseration of Palestinian Gazans, but also to insist and contribute to achieving their right to the city and the potential that rise, resides in Gaza and Palestine. Thank you. Sarah, you're muted. Excuse me. <laughs> I also want to thank the Palestine Museum for this lovely invitation and uh, uh, Dean Sharp as well. The first time I met Michael was in his office in New York City. We had already engaged in a lively email correspondence about a manuscript that would become Open Gaza, which was still in its infancy and how I might participate. I was extremely flattered by Michael's invitation to contribute to the volume, since I knew of his pioneering and courageous work as an architect and urbanist. Sitting and speaking with him was a joy, and I might add a bit of a challenge, but a very engaging one. We did not initially agree on certain terminology or concepts, but his profound decency and passion for the project were compelling and inspiring. I left our meeting thinking how fortunate I was to be a part of it, even a small part. I have reflected elsewhere on the role of the intellectual or scholar in writing on the Israeli-Palestinian crisis on issues that are highly contentious and sensitive and often outside what are considered acceptable and legitimate boundaries. Michael broke those boundaries in his own field and again with open Gaza. Indeed, if the role of authority is to obfuscate, then the role of the intellectual is to reveal which is the informing dynamic of this very important and pathbreaking work. I'd like to share uh, one story from my long experience in <clears throat> the occupied territory. Many years ago, when I was living in the West Bank, a Palestinian employee of an American NGO was shot and badly injured by an Israeli soldier. The director of the NGO was a friend of mine and asked me to accompany him to a meeting with a senior Israeli military official where he intended 
to voice his outrage and seek an explanation. The meeting did not last long. After my friend expressed his horror at the shooting of his employee who was unarmed and working on a project in the area where the incident occurred, the Israeli officer who had listened quietly and I might add did not dispute the facts, looked at both of us and simply shrugged. He then got up from the conference table where we were sitting and without saying a word, left the room followed by his staff. My friend and I remained in our seats stunned, not only by the official's incivility, but by what informed it, an utter lack of concern for the shooting of the Palestinian. The facts which so horrified us were for him devoid of any meaningful substance or ethical urgency. That meeting took place over 30 years ago. And in the decades since, the invalidation of Palestinians and their deprivation and dispossession have only deepened and found broad affirmation. Nowhere is this truer than in Gaza, which has been deliberately and systematically brought to ruin, positioned as marginal and exceptional. Now, Gaza's exceptionalism was made more acute by the Oslo agreements when the historical contest over territory was reframed by a policy of separation, isolation, and containment. Within this framework, Gaza and the West Bank were separated demographically and physically. As a result, a largely isolated Gaza came to be seen as existing outside a Palestinian state and a Palestinian nation. The policies that have come to define Gaza as exceptional are simply extensions, albeit more extreme, of policies long used to separate and isolate Palestinians in the West Bank and in Israel. In this regard, Gaza's status is part of a long and consistent policy continuum of containment, removal, and erasure. As such, Gaza became the model for the fragmentation of the West Bank into small disconnected enclaves under constant assault. Hence, it is important to understand that these policies of separation and exclusion make it difficult for Palestinians to imagine a larger sense of collective. And without that sense, exclusion becomes the defining basis for politics and policy. Because of this and the many assaults on the territory, Gaza is typically thought of as a site of despair and destruction and little more. It's people impoverished or villainous who are disposable and of no consequence. Yet as Open Gaza argues and Michael insisted, Gaza and her people are so much more and the sense of power that people have must not be overlooked as it often is. While addressing the destruction and damaging limitations imposed on Gaza, the book also addresses the potential that is very much alive there. Gaza is creativity, imagination, and innovation, all of which continue to thrive, despite the forces that relentlessly and daily seek to extinguish them. They, there are, in Gaza, doctors, nurses, psychologists, lawyers, engineers, scientists, IT specialists, architects, ar archaeologists, agronomists, hydrologists, environmentalists, academics, teachers, artists, writers, poets, actors, and musicians, and dancers, and many more. Gaza has universities, museums, theaters, concert halls, research centers, human rights organizations, and more. There is in Gaza a highly literate population and a skilled workforce, desperate and able to work if only they were allowed to do so. As I wrote in the preface to the book, through the discourses of architecture, planning, and environment, Open Gaza demonstrates how space can embody Palestinian aspirations, envisioning possibility and meaningful change that is predicated on peace and the demilitarization of space, on human rights and on the end of division and separation where physical borders are no longer determinative. What Gaza needs is a level playing field. What Gaza needs is freedom and reconnection with other Palestinians and with the larger world, and then the rest will follow. Recently, <clears throat> I spoke with a friend of mine in Gaza. When I asked him, what do you want the world to know about Gaza and Gazans? He said, quote, that Gazans are creative, determined, and generous. I, as a Gazan, don't wish the world to see me as an oppressed person who begs for the world's sympathy, but as someone who was not given the chance to prove himself as capable of not only changing himself and his society, but of changing the world for the better, end quote. When asked, what is your wish for Gaza in the future, another young man said to be, quote, to be a normal society with poverty, class differences, government inefficiency, problems that any society has. Israel's struggle against the Palestinian people is, in my view, fundamentally about their presence 
and their representation to the world. It is about diminishing, if not removing their certainty by depriving them of agency and capacity and condemning them for their own privation. Palestinians have resisted, yet their resistance in all its forms is not enough. Palestinians, like all people in the Middle East, must be seen and understood far beyond the negative and motionless characterizations imposed upon them. They must be seen as a civil society with aspirations no different from our own. They must be seen as the solution to the problems of their region, far more effective than authoritarian rulers or military interventions. Open Gaza is a critical step along this path, a much needed and timely corrective that transcends impossibility toward vision, reconnection, and ultimately justice. I would like to end with an excerpt from Albert Camus' 1957 Nobel Prize acceptance speech. It speaks of Michael and, in my view, what inspired Open Gaza. Camus writes, or he wrote, the writer's role is not free from difficult duties. By definition, he cannot put himself today in the service of those who make history. He is at the service of those who suffer it. Otherwise, he will be alone and deprived of his art. Not all the armies of tyranny with their millions of men will free him from his isolation, even and particularly if he falls into step with them. But the silence of an unknown prisoner abandoned to humiliations at the other end of the world is enough to draw the writer out of his exile, at least whenever in the midst of the privileges of freedom, he manages not to forget that silence and to transmit it in order to make it resound by means of his art. Thank you. Sorry, can you? هل تسمعون أنا؟ Okay. Um, hello, everybody. This is uh, Yara Sharif and Nasser Gulzari. Excuse us that we will be speaking in English. Uh, and um, to start with, thank you very much for the Palestinian Museum for hosting the event. It's such an honor to uh, be part also of the fantastic coastal exhibit for this to coincide with the fantastic coastal exhibition currently taking place. Uh, thank you, Adila. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Sara. Hala and also the organizers Marah for making this a success and also for the uh, people who are attending, uh, I, I can see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, our presentation is going uh, to be more maybe showing the architectural side or the spatial perspective of how we thought about Gaza, Nasser and I as part of Palestine Regeneration Team, but also uh, how our researchers and our students look into that. So we will be very quick and brief, but please feel free to have a look at the book because this is where you will see more details. And, and it's very important to mention here that the book represents, is quite a, uh, what I would say, an inspiring multi and interdisciplinary uh, book, which is not just about architecture and it's not by architects only, but it actually goes across uh, so many disciplines, which is very important to realize that what is happening in Gaza, in Palestine, and in many uh, now contexts, although the context of Palestine is quite special, it does uh, represent involvement and engagements of many professions, many of us at different scales. So this what we have been looking at is not just about reconstruction of uh, in terms of planning and architecture, but actually culture. Uh, students are here as well, so they can actually have a look. It's very relevant to what they're doing at the moment. 
the chapter we contributed with on Gaza is called Absurd City Subversity. And it's part of the ongoing uh, research by design that we've been doing as Palestine Regeneration Team to rethink Palestine, to rethink means of uh, challenging the fragmentation, particularly when it comes to the overall historic map of Palestine. Uh, it, because of the contested uh, space, because of the urban morphology of the land being pushed to extreme, we felt that there is a need to question the role of architecture with strategies that combat the occupation. So in Absurd City, our in Absurd City, basically, uh, our contribution to the book mainly looked at new ways to reread and redraw Gaza uh, and its absurd landscape, or what we call the absurd landscape. And in Subversity, the other part of the book is more of a design-driven aspect where we explored spatial means to re-inhabit Gaza again. Uh, we very much concentrated on what we called subversive tactics as an alternative to the ideological destruction of space. And we explored that through speculative, but also through uh, live projects, as Dean and Nasser has mentioned. Um, so uh, one of the key aspects that we, when we were thinking about Gaza, particularly when we see a context in ruins, thinking how do we narrate Gaza? How do we narrate a city where the city as a whole became a refugee camp, where the conventional definition and notion of a city or a spatial formation has actually changed? The slide is not moving. Sorry, can you see the slides? So if one of the particular aspects that we were also looking at in Gaza is what is the notion of home became a very important aspect when thinking about the city. What is the threshold, the threshold of home in such a temporary landscape? How do we define home and how do we define a, a space of accommodation? Uh, I don't know why the... I think you have to go off the full screen, perhaps. Sorry, I'm going to stop share and reshare again. Maybe you can share your screen. Sorry, bear with me. Can you share? Okay, bear with me, please. Let me see. If can you see my screen? So, yeah, you, you can't see my screen. No, can you okay. reshare it, please? Okay. Um, Please tell me if you see my screen. Yes, we can. Yeah, we see. And it's working. All right. Okay. I apologize for this. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, within the context of uh, Gaza, we were wondering mm -hmm. uh, how do we think a city when the whole fabric has been exposed? and when the relationship between the internal space and the external space is blurred, when Gazans can no longer dwell the city in a conventional sense, how do we draw that relationship between the street, the block, the room, and the, li and the living room when that relationship has changed? So in our drawings, uh, in this drawing that you can see, in, in this, in other words, we started to conceptualize the space in the way in which we can see, we can draw, and we can somehow create a physical condition where a space at the scale of the uh, house, which is this one below, and also at the scale of uh, the neighborhood, uh, this, at the larger scale, can function in a condition which is absurd and dysfunctioning. 
it was also very important for us uh, to realize that through, again, through these drawings that we're looking at two different scales. We're scale, looking at the scale of the person, the family house, but also the very larger scale of Palestine, which goes beyond Gaza, beyond West Bank, and it connects. Very importantly, in this uh, sketch, we are showing a number of what we call conceptually stitching, stitching number of potential locations across the fragmented landscape. For us, um, it's quite important that this, within this subvert, subvert city, uh, the absurdity of it goes beyond our mental condition so that we can actually uh, encourage movement across the border. So that it's not only the border that is taking us away from our right to city, but actually we, we jump beyond it. So mobility becomes a key issue, uh, especially in the case of Palestinians, in order to be able to have the right to city. Um, so drawing on the debates on right of the city to the city became very uh, important. Mm. So within that kind of, if you like, uh, narrative of going beyond the borders and be able to dream how you can move across the borders, we came up with this idea of a, what we call a green lab. The green lab is a, uh, a kind of a more mobile unit which in itself addresses three different conditions, which is very important in the context, we saw it in the context of Gaza when we visited in 2009 and 10 and afterwards. The three conditions is a farm condition, uh, where the, the green lab can actually integrate itself and extend it to the farm and, uh, and to the farmhouse. The second one, which is a different scale, is a parasite to existing urban uh, ruins, because we know that uh, quite a large number of demolition was and destruction was done in the city, but importantly, connecting uh, to the sea, a floating structure that can move across and address the fishing and other um, sources. In order to do that, we also uh, try working with actually John Houston, who was part of the uh, Open Gaza team and came to some of our uh, seminar sessions that we had with Michael and the others in London, who he produced a, ca uh, a catalog, a kind of a, um, a kind of an atlas of recyclable materials, the materials that were available and was practiced within the borders, the borders that we could not bring anything from outside. And uh, through that atlas and also through our visits, we actually started to run a series of workshops both in uh, Palestine and Gaza, and also in London. So we started to work with uh, engineers inside uh, in Palestine and Gaza, and also architects and other planners, etc., in London to come up to develop the idea of this typology, the Green Lab. So the Green Urban Lab, um, in this case, uh, here is kind of uh, the typology acts as a threshold between the private and the public, which is on the edge, on the, on the edge of the neighborhood, if you like. Um, and in, the, in this condition, in this drawing that you can see, it's more uh, of a uh, typology that, that relies and uses the maximum uh, cultural practices of courtyard, but also it can extend and expand. So the communities can, actually families can help each other in terms of finishing off the work. So the, uh, this lab or this green lab is actually a very incomplete work which gets completed by the Palestinians. And the idea that it wasn't used, it, it, it doesn't rely on the use of cement, which was not available in Gaza, but also tries to rely on available techniques and available everyday practices that the community uh, use. And in this case, you can see that we start to use some of the current mobility practices uh, like the animals, carts, and also the way that parts of this uh, green lab as a core can actually move across and move to other locations. What was important about this green lab was that when we were working with the UN, they actually started to use that as a kind of typology for many schools. So it became a green learning room where uh, these were built within the reconstructed schools. Here you can see one of the conditions, the parasite. This is another typology quickly that also we were thinking of, which is the room as a parasite, which was mainly to, to think about intervention that can attach themselves to the destroyed buildings in Gaza. And here we wanted to question the notion of home and dwelling or resilience. In here reading home, we felt it was very important that we cannot read it, uh, we cannot read home without 
the objects that used to uh, formulate it, the artifacts that form memory that have accumulated over time. Most of these are currently absent or dislocated. Therefore, with the city fabric left in, bows, in bones, the room as a parasite became a way to put emphasis on the skin, to define only what happens inside it, mm. a way to question dwelling and resilience. So in, in this case, the parasitic aspect that became outside was only a way to frame the ruins that are inside it. Inter internal he here is not only about uh, cushions and sofa, internal became about memories of the past and very much about the unconventional way of reading domesticity. And all the elements that are weird, all the components comes from the atlas that exist on site, but also it's been reappropriated by the Palestinians because the Gazaians are so skilled in terms of their labor and their knowledge of building construction that they can actually reassess this. And also they would be attaching themselves to extend to provide extended family, which is part of the, the cultural practices and also uh, social needs of the Gazaians and the Palestinians. So, so they kind of act not only as something that provides uh, clean water, uh, electricity and also green uh, vertical gardens, but also it extends the room, extends the garden. And here in this image you can see, which is actually one of our students, researchers. Um, oops. Back. Let's go again. Just oh, okay. yeah. Maybe so just we'll, go we'll just go slowly about some of the projects that surfaced as a result. Um, yeah, so this is the one which uh, it attaches itself to the, uh, the, the parasites that set in the urban context where the uh, high blocks are demolished but actually being constructed down here. This is another one, Andreas is providing a kind of a, a, a the production regeneration if you, generator, electric, electricity generator inside the uh, destroyed blocks. And Andreas used the whole uh, metal work of the windows in Gaza to create a new skin for the city. And part of our research work that we have done uh, with our students, especially ourselves, is to connect the sea and the city and the land. So we started to look at agriculture. Here is uh, another project which goes right there, which goes right to the edge of the border, but also subverts the border by going beyond that. Uh, these are just quickly mm. different examples. Please feel free to have a look at the book to see more explanation yeah. of this. But for us, it's very critical that uh, wow. the project goes beyond Gaza, because Palestinians are not only in Gaza and West Bank, but they go all across what it's considered 1948 Palestine, but also their voice has to be heard. And uh, that's where well, we, at times, we actually develop ideas that mobility is being broken and it's, it provides an alternative access to across the whole of the land. And most importantly, provoke discussion about overall Palestine and connecting and not forgetting that Gaza is part of a bigger context. So thank you very much. Sorry for the uh, technical hiccup. Well, thank you, Yara. Thank you very much. Um, hello? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. <coughs> you can hear me, right? Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. okay uh, today I'm going to talk about counter mapping, uh, which is an important uh, part of my. Hello. Do you hear me? Um, hello. Yes. Can you? Can you? If you can, you can speak a little bit because you don't have the audio. You can speak on the laptop. أم وفي كمان مش عارفة حواليك الضجة بعرفش إذا في كان مينيمايزت خليني I just want to make sure that the interpreters can hear you uh, just a moment Do you hear me now? 
yes, I think it's better. Um, okay. خلفية. هناك أصوات أخرى في الخلفية. Yes, um, yes. Um, هلا في ضجة عندك والمترجمة مش كتير عارفة تسمع. Um, هلا سمعتيني هلا هاي هلا كان يو هير مي يس كان يو هير مي ناو يس بس في كثير ضجه حواليكي uh, في المكان اللي انت اللي انت قاعده فيه بس كان يو بليز سيت كلوزر تو ذا لابتوب يس ثانك يو Is it clear now? Yes, let me check with the interpreter. Okay. أفضل هلا رانيا جمانة. نعم نعم الصوت أفضل تفضلي. تمام بتقدر تبلش شكرا هلا. اليوم سأتحدث عن رسم الخرائط العكسي وهو. I will be unpacking the invisible. Uh, I will be unpacking the invisible layers of the everyday phenomena uh, that have emerged out of the severe conditions in Palestine, specifically in the Gaza Strip, a fractured and besieged landscape that has been subjected to four consecutive wars in less than 13 years and has been in isolation since, since 2007. I will use counter mapping uh, as a technique to reread the city uh, with its socio-political layers. I will also explore uh, whether it can assist uh, us in imagining what I call recovery spaces, which can be seen as uh, a way to imagine uh, a hopeful future for Gaza where spatial justice can be achieved. When it comes to Gaza, uh, spatial injustice or justice is like well embedded within the landscape, siege, sanctions, occupation, conflict and limited resources, economic and environmental crisis all have impacted the way uh, one occupies the city and the way it is developing over the years. And through my research, I aim to really the city in an attempt to understand its morphology particularly with uh, the creative, resilient practices that have emerged out of the necessity, going from the alleyways of the refugee camps, streets, squares, bare beaches, uh, the wadi, the tunnel, the sea, and even the sky, I will try to unpack what has been overtaken by the dominant images of war and destruction. And the main question here, uh, why does mapping, counter mapping, seem to be an important proposition in the context of Gaza? And if one researches the map of Gaza, the general formula that overshadows the results is the negative and frustrating uh, map in which Gaza is defined as uh, a separate entity from the land of Palestine and the West Bank. And uh, the result of the research will provide images of maps that revolve in its entirety around the crossings and the land water borders of the Gaza Strip, which imposed by the Israeli forces. The one may not be able to find out tourist map for the Gaza Strip. It is the big prison that is difficult to get out and enter. So this is the most popular picture about Gaza. And unfortunately, this might be the only picture that results from the cartographic research in Gaza, whereas in contrast, there are other forms that this cartographic system can tolerate. Where a, where a person who experienced the Gaza Strip or lived there for a while uh, can, could be able to build them. These newly built maps may reveal the other side of the Gaza Strip, which appears completely absent and is ignored despite the beauty of its content as it embodies form of human struggle and steadfastness against the siege and the political oppression instrument, whatever the tools and means are. This is in 
turn raises an important question. If one wants, wants to visit the Gaza Strip, what is the form of the tourist map for the Gaza Strip that can be introduced to a visitor? Or we can say also, what are the places that may be uh, vital signs that Gaza needs to highlight and talk about? What are the forms of tourist attractions that a trapped space for more than 13 years can or, or may produce? Is there a human cultural and uh, cultural heritage or creative content worth displaying? Is there a history of narration still alive after four consecutive wars? Few months ago, while the war was still going there in Gaza, I was wondering why were the narrative stories, memories, rooted and interactive dynamics between people and tall buildings in the Gaza Strip have not been brought up before the war. These narratives were always there, but they have not been captured until they become ashes. We lost a lot of narratives that can be told about Gaza vertically up to the clouds from high towers and multi-story buildings after they have been bombed by the Israeli army. All we receive about people and their displacement journey are captured moments taken by a passing journalist or a photographer who was outside the whole scene. We might receive their stories charged with fear and saturated with details. However, we only get the narration of the events that occurred in reality by the person awareness of these people, while all the other details that happen subconsciously fall from the novel. So I was wondering if it was possible to draw a map that attracts the personal displacement journey, including reactions, escapes, st uh, distances, stops, and even beyond. Maybe there might be an opportunity to hunt down relationships latent in the surrounding, measure safety distance, intersections, the dark side of the route, safe intersections, rest stations, critical stops, and other scenarios that we might call the unseen. This map will show the deep and detailed topographic landscape uh, and its direct uh, uh, repercussions on the inherent consciousness of the person. This, the map embodies an integrated front of action and reaction, event and response. We will realize how long and slow the road is under a cover of missiles and, art, uh, and artillery uh, strikes. It might be filled with details and emotional moments and with vacillating physical and psychological distances. I think this cartographic documentation will have a scale of a drawing that is different and exceptional with a rhythm that does not look like anything else. It could be a DNA that cannot be copied and repeated. This map will bring a true confrontation to the dominant traditional image about war and displacement. It will reveal the truth that cannot be tolerated by any other novel. This is what we call counter mapping, which is incredibly broad and rich concept that can take also many forms. Maptivism, protest mapping, subversive uh, maps, and counter mapping. It refers to the production of maps that counteract dominant power structures with the aim of breaking with hegemonic discourses monopoly over the representation of reality for the purpose of defending ethnic, cultural, or political minority and vulnerabilities interests. And due to their intent of the countering dominant representations of property regimes and urban practices, they have opened up a new political terrain on which struggles linked to fundamental questions of culture, identity, and power. So the production and use of counter maps can denounce situations of social injustice and to promote actions directed at uh, writing them. And I will end up my talk with uh, what Edward Said says, the struggle over geography is not only about soldiers and cannons, but also about ideas, about forms, about images and imagining. So decolonization and the struggling and the struggle for social justice requires that they've, what also David Harvey calls the geographical imagination. So thank you.
Well, thank you, Hala. Uh, well done, uh, Hala. Very good. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, Hala, would you like to um, to uh, to give uh, closing uh, remarks or? Is there not going to be any questions? Okay, if there is no questions. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, is is a fee ممكن تعملوا raise hand تحت. If you have any question, please raise your hand uh, in the bottom by clicking on the button below. The questions can be asked in Arabic or English. الأسئلة ممكن تنسأل بالعربي أو بالإنجليزي. Uh, I think no. Uh, Hala? Yes. Okay. طيب حتى نختم. في ختام هذا اللقاء طبعا أود التأكيد على أنه وجودنا هون كمتحدثين ومستمعين ومهتمين ومنظمين أيضا من المتحف الفلسطيني هو شكل آخر يمكن من أشكال الأمل الأمل بأنه قطاع غزة كمساحة خلاقة ستكون قادرة يوما ما على التعافي من ألمها والتغلب على كل هذا القهر والألم والظلم في مقولة لمحمود درويش بيحكي فيها أن ندبة ذاكرة لا تكف عن العمل وأنا أقول أن كل هذه الندوب التي تركها الاحتلال وتبعاته من ظلم وقهر ودمار وموت ستذكرنا دوما بقيمة نضالاتنا وبهذا التاريخ الغني بقصص الصمود الإنساني والتي بنظري قدم في قد قدم فيها الشعب الفلسطيني نموذج إبداعي وإنساني مليء بالعبر والقيم هذه الندوب ستلهمنا بالكثير وهذا الكتاب بالتحديد كما ذكر دين في بداية حديثه بدأ بشرارة غضب شعر بها سركين اتجاه كل هذه التجاوزات اللا إنسانية واللا أخلاقية التي يقوم بها الاحتلال اتجاه الفلسطينيين وما نقوم به اليوم كباحثين من سرد وتحليل لما يدور على الأرض في قطاع غزة والضفة الغربية وفلسطين ككل هو محاولة حثيثة لتقديم رواية حقيقية كاملة لكل ما يتم طمسه كل يوم بفعل الاحتلال وسياسته وهذه السرديات ستكون قادرة يوما ما على توحيد هذا الشرخ والتشرذم والانقسام الذي يسعى الاحتلال لتعزيزه منذ أكثر من حوالي 70 عام من هنا بحب أكد مجددا على ضرورة أن تظل الرواية حاضرة على ألسنتنا جميعا هي ثقافة مقاومة نسعى بها لتعزيز جذورنا كفلسطينيين في الأرض وأعرج هنا أيضا على مقالة أدوارد سعيد حول الرواية حيث قال أن الرواية هي الثقافة التي تحصن أصحابها وتحميهم من الذوبان في منظومة الهيمنة التي تملى عليهم من الخارج شكرا لكل الحاضرين هون وأتمنى أنه تنقلوا أيضا أنتم كل الروايات التي استمعتم عليها في هذا الحدث وفي لقائنا وشكرا لكم دمتم بألف خير شكرا هالا واو ما فيش إيش نضيفه يعني there is nothing to add after what you said thank you everyone شكرا جزيلا دين يارا شريف ناصر جلزاري سارة روي وهلا وهلا كلكم جميعا thank you everyone who attended the event شرف كتير كبير إلنا إنكم تكونوا موجودين معنا اليوم I would like to note that the book is going to be available at the Palestinian Museum's gift shop very soon the the session is going to be uh, uploaded to our Facebook and media and other social media channels um, uh, tomorrow in the freaking day. Shukran uh, jazilan. Shukran. Shukran ilkum. Ma'a salama. Shukran lal jamia. Shukran lal matahaf al-Palestini. Shukran lal mustamaeen. Let's keep accumulating power. Akid. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Well done, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, abil manin hai, bidi asajir kum tzuru al-ma'arad. Whenever you can. Shukran. Ma'a salama.